Hello there, everybody. My name is Lewis Whelan. I publish the official relocation guides on Atlanta that are distributed by the first multiple listing service of Atlanta, which is the fourth largest multiple listing service in the United States with 52,000 member agents. Um, the magazines are all about Atlanta and are designed to acquaint people with the area, along with the website atlantacommunityprofiles.com. And um, on that website, we, have, we do house the magazines, along with a great deal of other information about Atlanta. We recently added a resource directory, which is designed to be helpful to agents with their clients who are buying and selling houses. And we've provided a list there of different products and services that are helpful if you're buying or selling a house or a commercial property. And um, I'm also a realtor with K KW Commercial, and my focus is multifamily and uh, in industrial warehouses and restaurants. And uh, if you would like to talk with me, my email is lou at louwheeland.com. Thank you very much for listening. And um, our guest today is Brandon Beach, Senator Brandon Beach. Welcome back to our show, Senator Beach. You Glad to be with you. Show. Thanks for having me. I know you were on our radio show on 920 for quite a few times over the years, and we switched formats here to provide a video more based format. But Senator Beach was, uh, was elected to the Senate in 2013 and he represents District 21 with portions of Cherokee and Fulton County. Um, he is also uh, executive uh, director of the North Fulton Community Improvement District, and, um, which was founded in 2003 by Brandon and others. They've, uh, they basically cover the area from Mansell Road to McGinnis Ferry, uh, road and um, basically it's founded or supported by commercial property owners independently of your taxes and um, they pay a voluntary tax and since it's it's it's, it's inception they've have collected more than uh, 22 million from volunteers in that area which was leveraged into 116 million dollars in improvements over the years so Sir, first of all, Senator, thank you for your service to our community. I know you have an unbelievable schedule, which, uh, with all that, you're also head of the uh, Senate Transportation Committee, a chairman of the Transportation Committee, and a member of Economic Development and Tourism, Higher Education, Administrative Affairs, and Rules. So you're a pretty busy person. And... Um, well, thank you. Senator, um, I know there's a lot to talk about, and uh, one of the things that I know is near and dear to the hearts of everybody, in North Atlanta especially, is Highway 400, and everything that's going on down there from the perimeter on up to higher north. Tell us, give us an overview, if you would, please, on that project. Well, I can tell you that, uh, first off, uh, again, Lou, thanks for having me on the show. And, and I would just say this, there's a direct correlation between infrastructure investment and economic development. And I think when you look at Georgia 400, it's probably one of the best examples in the country. When they built Georgia 400 back in the 70s, I, I remember Mark Burkhalter telling me he was in high school at Milton High School, the old Milton High School, and they would go sit on Georgia 400 and wouldn't see a car for three hours. And everybody wondered why they built that road. It was, you know, the road to nowhere. And they spent all that money on that road and nobody used it. Well, guess what? Uh, it, it spurred economic development in Windward. Once mobile development put that investment in Windward and built those homes and AT&T and MCI and all these technology companies came up here because Alfredo was smart enough to put fiber in the ground and had world-class uh, infrastructure, fiber infrastructure, uh, that helped spur development. And now, uh, you know, you, you see cars on Georgia 400 all hours of the day, and it's been a great investment and spurred a lot of economic development. But we're not, we're not finished there. As you know, 285 and 400 is under construction now 
and that will be open January 1st. That interchange will be completed uh, in about six months, seven months. And then uh, we're going to build two new lanes northbound and two new lanes southbound from uh, 285 up to McFarland Road. And then in between there, we're going to build a new interchange at McGinnis Ferry Road and 400 and widen um, um, McGinnis Ferry from 400 to Emory Johns Creek hospital. So you'll have four lane access from 400 to 85. So that'll be another east-west connectivity. Like you have old Milton and Holcomb Bridge, you can go east-west. So I'll just give you another option from east-west. And again, north-south, you'll have four new lanes, two southbound and two northbound. So we're, we're going to continue to invest in the Georgia 400 corridor because we know there's right now there's 900 technology companies up the Georgia 400 corridor. And we want to continue to be kind of the tech hub of, of Georgia up here in this North Fulton corridor. So you're going to see a lot of, a lot of investment. Well, it's nice to see planning for the future because uh, with roads and transportation, especially the way the Atlanta metro area is growing, it's, it's pretty hard to forecast our growth. It's, uh, we just had interviewed the president of FMLS earlier today and uh, talked about the phenomenal increase in values. What uh, what would you like to say about a forecast? Without trying, we're not trying to put you on the spot, but what do well, you think it, about it? How's you know, it looking going forward? Well, ARC is projecting uh, in the next ten years another two and a half million people coming to the Metro Atlanta uh, area, and, and if you look at their projections, um, recent projections, they're always conservative on that. They always uh, their estimate always is exceeded. So we're going to have two and a half to three million people coming to Metro Atlanta in the next three years because of our our climate, our education, our workforce. Uh, you know, we got the busiest airport in the world. You can fly out of uh, Hartsfield Jackson Airport and be anywhere on the East Coast within two hours. So um, and, and then we have a port of Savannah, which is a huge economic engine, which I'd like to talk a little bit later about freight and logistics and what we've got going on there. But but Lou, we, we are an economic engine uh, for the state up here in this 400 corridor. So we're gonna continue to invest in it. One other thing I would tell you is we're committed to have bus rapid transit up the middle of 400. So we're gonna have uh, at least four bus stations where you can take rapid bus transit and go straight into Atlanta on a night uh, bus clean with Wi-Fi and so on. So we're going to continue to invest in transit because that's what some of the young people want. One of the things that's happened, Lou, is talent drives everything. It used to be years ago, a CEO would decide where they wanted to go based on where he or his wife wanted to live or she or her husband wanted to live. Today, you, you look at that and that CEO is making the decision, not where he or she wants to live, but based on where's the talent. Talent is dictating and driving all these relocations. So what we've got to do is make sure, one, we have the infrastructure in place and make sure we have the educated workforce and education in place. And that's one of the things North Fulton's done a really good job of. They've got out of the top 10 SAT scores, six of them are right here from North Fulton. So as long as we have good education and now we've got that new Gwinnett Tech across from Avalon, that's really helping. Uh, we have the best technical college system in the country here in Georgia. And we can train people and we, we can actually tailor a program for a company to fit their needs. And that's a big plus through the technical college system of Georgia. Senator, the um, key issue today among many people is office space. And um, tell us a little bit about how you see that now and going forward with work at home from COVID and so forth. Well, I can tell you this, just in the last three months, we've seen our parking lot fill up at our office building. We've seen people going up and down the elevator. We've seen people coming in and out. Uh, I think people want to get back to work. I do think I do COVID think has COVID changed, has the, changed landscape the landscape in, in, a, in, sense in that a sense that it has, it proven, has proven that you can, that you can be at home and, at home be, productive. and be productive. Uh, that, uh, being that being said, said I, I, I tell you, I, I, I was talking, I, I, I to, I was a talking to a business, business executive, executive the other day, the other day and, he and he was telling me, he said, listen, he said, listen, he said you know who wants to get back in the office sooner rather than later? It's the young people. 
you would think you would the young, think people, the young would people would want to stay, want home, stay home with all the with technology, all the technology savvy, savvy they have, they have. But, they but they want to get back, get in, the back office, in the office because that's the only way they're going to let their they're, 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 they're going to be able to prove to their bosses and show off to their bosses that they're they're working hard, that they're productive, and building those relationships so they can get promoted. The older people, they like working out of the house and kind of want to stay home now. But but the younger people are are chomping at the bit to get back to work and have those social skills so they can they can kind of impress their 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 bosses and move up the corporate ladder. So that I found that comment interesting. Uh, but I, I really think, you know, people want to be around people. I don't think people want to be home all day, every day. Uh, so I do think we will see uh, the office market come back. It may be different. Uh, I know, for example, GDOT, I think, you know, they're looking at getting rid of two floors at the GDOT headquarters because they, they may not need that space anymore. I've heard of other companies reassessing how much um, square footage they need. Uh, but I do think there will be an office component. And I do think that's good for the restaurants. It's good for the economy to get people back out into the workforce and get back into an office. So and you're right about the housing market. It's the hottest I've ever seen it in my lifetime. Um, you know, I could sell my house tomorrow. The problem is I don't know where I'd move uh, because there's not a lot on the market. Somebody was telling me the other day, one of the real estate folks, and you can uh, um, attest to this, hopefully, but that Windward uh, only has three houses on the market right now out of 3,000 homes in the Windward subdivision. That used to have 40 or 50 houses on the market at any given time. So the market's a hot market, and that's good. It's really uh, uh, a, a unique situation, as you pointed out. You are chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee, Senator. Tell us a little bit about what's happening over there in that area of the world. Well, the biggest thing, you know, as you know, back in 2015, we passed House Bill 170, which was our funding bill. It really fundamentally changed how we build roads and bridges here in the, the state. Uh, it was a great bill. It's been hugely successful. Other states are copying that. And then two years ago, Kevin Tanner and I uh, passed the ATL, which really created a regional transit system, an entity called the ATL from a coordination standpoint, so that you could cross jurisdictional lines, county lines in a seamless, efficient, uh, clean, and most of all, safe manner. Now what we're doing is we've had a two-year study on freight and logistics, how we move product through our state. And that's important. We've got, we've got the Port of Savannah, which even during COVID grew at double digits, 16.6% uh, last year. It's grown at double digits for the last 10 years. It is a huge, huge uh, infrastructure and economic engine for our state. And it's the only port in the country, by the way, that exports more than it imports. We're at about a 52-48 ratio because of all of our agriculture products that we send all over the world. Our agriculture products are, are huge. You know, we're the number one, that's our number one industry. But that being said, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out a, when we bring that product in to the port, we've got to figure out how we get it from the port to a distribution center and then to your house uh, when you order on Amazon or however you order on the Internet. Um, because what's happened is during COVID, we had pre-COVID, we had two days, two days of, of e-commerce sales that exceeded two billion dollars. When COVID hit, every day for the last 10 months have been over $2 billion in revenue. And you can probably tell your listeners and the listeners could tell you that they see either an Amazon, a FedEx or a UPS truck in their subdivision now two or three times a day, not just once a day, because packages are being delivered all the time. So what we got to do is convince the public that that package just doesn't show up at your doorstep. It comes into a port, it gets on an 18-wheeler or a rail car. And then it goes to a distribution center, gets reworked, repacked, ordered, and then sent to your home. Uh, and what we're trying to do, Lou, in our study, it showed us a couple of things. One, it showed us that 83% of the, the traffic coming out of the ports on an 18-wheeler. So only 17% is on rail. Our goal is to work with CSX and Norfolk Southern and try to get that up to 35%. Because for every rail car you fill up, you take three and a half trucks off the road. So if we could take three and a half truckloads, um, trucks off the road, that would help on our truck traffic on 75, 85 and around 285. 
And I want you next time you're on 285, just look around at all the 18 wheelers. So we want to continue to have our port grow at double digits, but we want to figure out how to get more freight on rail. And it's just a timing thing. We've got to make sure we can get that freight here in a very efficient and, and timely manner. Right now, for example, um, a, a, train that, uh, a train that leaves Port of Savannah to go to St. Louis takes 48 hours. We're trying to get that down to 24 hours. If we can do that, we will see more and more freight go to St. Louis and Chicago. And that's another thing. Before we started this um, uh, Freight and Logistics Commission, I always had given speeches and said we were the freight and logistics hub of the Southeast. I was wrong. We're the freight and logistics hub of the Eastern Seaboard. When you look at where all of this freight goes, it goes all the way up the Eastern Seaboard. So um, we really are doing a lot. And, and so we've just got to figure out how we build truck lanes, how we get more product on rail, how we recruit more truck drivers. The trucking industry is telling us they don't have enough truck drivers. Uh, and then also the other issue we found is truck parking. There's not enough parking for these trucks. So a lot of times you'll see trucks on the entrance or the exit of an interchange park. Uh, that's because they have to stop because they, they'll get penalized if they drive for more than 10 hours. It's all electronic now. It's not paper logs, uh, printed logs. So they have to stop. And that's a safety hazard for the public when you see an 18 wheeler sitting there, that's not that's not safe for anybody. So we need to figure out how we get more truck parking. And we're looking at some bread a lots to convert and some different things to uh, give these truckers a place to park. So, Senator, we're looking at Highway 16 or what? What is uh, is that, how is that? Tell us a little bit about Highway yeah, 16. We're, highway 16, that's how the, the trucks come out of the port and, and come up to Atlanta. We're widening that. We're putting infrastructure in place, especially right there at 70, right in Macon at 75 and I-16. That's under construction as we speak. And uh, because we need to make sure we can get these trucks through, um, you know, in, in a timely manner. And so the, we're making improvements on all of our infrastructure. Uh, we've got, I think, the best commissioner in the United States, Russell McMurray. He's the best DOT commissioner there is. Uh, he's got a great four-year plan. Uh, the board's done a great job. And uh, we're going to see more and more infrastructure being built. And I do think there'll be an influx of, of federal money coming down, whether they pass an infrastructure bill or not. Uh, but I do think uh, we will see more and more money invested in infrastructure. So what is the role of railroads in the, in the macro equation? Well, I mean, that's what I said. We need to get that up from 17 to 35 percent. We're working with Norfolk Southern and CSX. I do think you're going to see what I call a railroad renaissance uh, back in our country, because I think uh, rail as far as freight, I think you'll see some more passenger rail too and some more investment in Amtrak. But the real key is to move freight on rail and reduce the truck traffic we have on our roads and, uh, and, and bridges. Uh, it'll extend the life of our roads and bridges if we can eliminate some of these heavy trucks and get this stuff on rail. Uh, so it's a, it's a win-win situation. So we're working very hard to encourage freight on rail. What about as a safety factor? Would that add an additional value? Oh yeah, that's it's a lot safer to have it on rail, have it double stacked and get it there uh, than it is to have those 18 wheelers. You're always, you know, you, every so often you'll hear about an 18 wheeler having an accident on 285 or overturning. And uh, it, it's, it's a safety issue for the driving public, but it's also when that happens, you usually have a four or five hour delay on 285 or 75 or 85. So um, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to encourage uh, as much freight moving on rail. And that's what we're doing. One other element of that equation is the warehousing industry, Senator. At yes. both ends at uh, Atlanta and, and the Savannah. And tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Well, you, you see more and more distribution centers being built around rail because they want to have the capability to have that rail come in. We've also invested heavily in our rail yard down at the port. It's the Jimmy Mason rail yard. And we just did a $10 million uh, investment on rail, on that rail yard. So we can, we can actually take the product from the ship and go straight to a rail car instead of taking it off and then transporting it over to a rail car. So that's a win-win too. Uh, that port is an amazing, amazing economic engine. When you look at our state, 
we really have three major economic engines, the Port of Savannah, Hartsfield Jackson Airport, and then the World Congress Center when the convention business comes back. And I do think uh, the convention business will start coming back after September. I think once people get more and more vaccinated, more and more people get vaccinated, I think you'll see a surge in people wanting to get back. I, I know I was in uh, Naples, Florida uh, last weekend for a wedding, not this weekend, the weekend before, and every hotel was packed, every restaurant was packed, uh, people are out traveling. So I, I think you're going to see that uh, convention center uh, get uh, get fired back up and, and you're going to see conventions. I will say this, Lou, to just be very frank and very blunt, if we don't get our crime rate and our, our crime under control, uh, we're going to have a hard time getting people to want to come here and have a convention or a Super Bowl or an all-star game. Uh, we have got to get this crime under control. Um, every time you turn on the TV, somebody's involved in a shooting and, and it's, uh, it's just kind of crazy and we need to stop this. We need to respect uh, life, number one, and also we need to uh, invest in law enforcement and, and make sure we have law enforcement uh, that uh, keeps our streets safe. Well, that is a big fact. I see the golf pro at a uh, golf course out here in Kennesaw was just recently killed and uh, near and dear to everybody that I know who plays golf. Yeah. And a great guy. What, everybody uh, that knew him said he was a great guy. And it was senseless what happened to him. And his, now his wife and two kids were, are without a father just because he went out there to see why a car was on the, on the green. I mean, uh, I hope they catch that guy and lock him up for good. Senator, to uh, stem the rise of crime in terms of legislation and getting more police officers, is there what what well, we uh, what would you what is your position on? We expansion? passed a bill last year that would not allow cities to defund the police. It was, I believe, it was Senate Bill Two Eighty Six. Uh, you can't defund the police. Now, is there some problems with police officers? Um, they may be a few bad apples. There's a few bad apples in every industry, but I can tell you that when I am under the rest, I want to be able to call a police officer and get help. And they're here to serve us. Uh, you know, I, I, we're, we should be very fortunate. We have people that want to do that job. They don't get paid a lot of money and they put their life on the line every time they put that uniform on. And I'm a big supporter of law enforcement and uh, we need to support law enforcement. We need to give them the tools in the toolbox. But I will tell you, the other thing is we got to get these judges to them when they do arrest somebody to not just let them out of prison the next day and have a revolving door and, and where they can come out and do another crime. Um, and, and it's just crazy. And, and people want to feel safe. And let me tell you, that's the role of the government, whether it's on the national level and it's keeping our country safe through national defense, or if it's on the local level and state level by having good police, uh, both at the state police level and the local police level, we have got to have good law enforcement and people have to respect law enforcement. I can tell you, I remember uh, when my when I got my license, I, I grew up in Louisiana, I got my license at 15. And I remember my dad telling me how what a, what a privilege it was to have a driver's license. And that if I got pulled over by a police officer, you know, you give them your license, you say, yes, sir, no, sir. And you don't argue with them and you come home and then you'll deal with me and I'll take care of you for getting a ticket. And I was more scared of my dad than I was a judge or uh, or a police officer. So we just have somehow between then and now we've lost respect for law enforcement. And that's that's not good. We've got to get back to where we respect law enforcement and um, and that we have good public safety because it's key to economic development and just having safe neighborhoods. Uh, nobody wants to live where they don't feel they can go outside without, you know, you know, having problems. So. Uh, my take is we need to support law enforcement. And if we do that, we'll get our convention business back. If people feel safe and can walk from a hotel to a convention center, they'll come here and they'll have conventions. They'll spend money. And tourism is a big part of our economy in the city of Atlanta. we got to get those hotels back full and get that convention center back full. Senator, I, I'm, I'm just asking this out of a naive point of view, but is there any kind of a safety commission within the, within the state government? Yeah, we have government? a, John Albers is chairman of public safety, and he's working on several issues to combat crime and 
to give law enforcement the, the tools that they need in their toolbox to make sure that they uh, can enforce enforce the law and keep our, our, our streets safe. And John's done a good job, Senator Albers. The um, city of Atlanta has had an increase in crime, significant increase in crime. Anything on the drawing boards to deal with that or how do, where do we stand with that? Well, you're gonna have a new mayor's race coming up in November. And I think that's gonna be one big issue. Uh, obviously it's an issue now you see there's folks that wanna create the new city of Buckhead uh, because they wanna be able to hire their own police force. They wanna take control of their, their city. They feel like they're paying taxes and they're not getting a good return on their investment and they don't feel safe. You know, when they go out and, you know, you, you saw about a month ago, a guy with Buckhead went out for a jog and got shot. He was just out jogging uh, and, and uh, went out for a run and got shot. And then another lady was on the, I guess, one of the greenways or was out strolling with her child and she got knifed, a pregnant woman. Uh, so people, you know, they want to live in a safe community and they're, they're willing to pay taxes, but they want to see a return on their investment. And um, when you're not seeing any resources being put towards your safety, then you're going to clamor for a new city. And that's what's happened in Buckhead. But I do think with a new mayor, uh, we will have, and, and maybe some new leadership, we will have a uh, opportunity to, to put an end to this. Well, let's hope so. It's actually a problem throughout the United States, it seems to be, in certain cities more so than others. And um, well, I mean, you look at this weekend, uh, of Fourth of July weekend, they had 88 shootings in Chicago, 18 people murdered. I mean, that's in three days, a three-day weekend? That's, un that's uncalled for. I think and, I read, uh, 240 people throughout the United States who were killed over the weekend. Yeah, I mean, that's, we're better than that. We don't, we've got to respect people more than that. So you're on the edu Higher Education Committee, Senator? Yes. Give us an update yes. on that, if you would, please. Well, I mean, we, we, there again, we have great higher education institutions, Georgia, Georgia Tech, um, you know, and we got private schools, Emory and Mercer and different schools here. I can just tell you that in, in my economic development role, when a, when a company comes here, a prospect, first thing they ask about, tell us about your education, tell us about your educated workforce. Can we hire people for what we, what we do? And whether, you know, whatever company is, XYZ company, they have to have employees and they want to know that they have a educated workforce that is being developed and trained at all times. And that's what the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech, they, they do that for us. And they put out some high quality individuals. I mean, we got the best engineering uh, folks coming out of Georgia Tech. And when you look at now, Georgia Tech is not just putting out engineers. They're, they're really incubating entrepreneurs out of that tech village over there across the street from Georgia Tech. Um, there's a lot of really great ideas that are coming out and companies that are being formed right out of college, out of, out of dorm rooms, if you will. So we're very, very, very fortunate to have great higher education. And that's one of the reasons we're the number one state to do business. We've got good, great K through 12, great technical college system. And then you top it off with a great higher education system. And uh, it's a recipe for victory and, and wins. And that's what we've done, and, and we're continuing to do well. Senator, Amazon has built a lot of warehouses up 85, and rumor has it that there might be some coming to 75. What do you, yeah, there what is, does industrial uh, development look like to you uh, going up 75 to through Georgia? Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, I, I've, I've been told Amazon's looking at one Chick-fil-A open to a distribution center up on 75 up near Cartersville. Um, so you're going to see more and more of that um, because they're going to, they're going to want to get product to Chattanooga and Nashville, and they're going to want to have the, obviously serve the Atlanta Metro area. So um, look, we, we are a distribution hub of the Southeast and really the, like I said, the Eastern seaboard. So we're very, very strategic in what we're doing. And we've been very fortunate that we've been invested in uh, infrastructure on, on, for both the distribution side and, uh, you know, also the retail side and so on. So we're, we're, we're I think we're in a good place. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, grow. And that's a good thing for your industry. You're going to sell more houses. Um, you know, I talked to a developer and they, they just can't get lots fast enough to build houses. And then 
the other thing they're having trouble with is getting appliances. I had a developer tell me the other day that as soon as he pulls a permit for to build a house, he orders the uh, kitchen appliances. And he never used to do that. He used to do that three or four weeks out before he was finished. But it's the, the time for it to be built because of COVID and some of the parts they need. Uh, but I do think we'll get out of that too. And I think we'll get back to somewhat normal on, on uh, product being delivered too. So hopefully we'll, we'll get better on that too. What about the uh, private lanes on 75? Have that been, get us an update on that and its success. Well, let me tell you, I've been in the transportation world for 20 years. I was on Greta G. Now in transportation in the Senate. And I can just tell you this. In 20 years, I would get mostly calls that people were upset about something. Fix this interchange, fix this pothole. Well, we need a red light here. Why don't you fix this, this, or this? When we built that 20, it was 29 miles of uh, reversible lanes, the longest stretch of reversible lanes in the United States, from 75 and 285 all the way up to Cherokee County and Sixes Road. And when we opened that, I got nothing but positive comments, positive emails. People saying, hey, I got home 25 minutes faster. Thank you for building these lanes. And that has propelled us into building other lanes. The two lanes I talked about on 400, we're going to build two new lanes, uh, both east and west on the top end of 285. We've got some lanes, managed lanes on 75 south, about a 15 mile stretch. And then we're going to do some others on 85. So we have got a program where we're going to build a 120 mile uh, network that's going to all come together in the next 10 years, eight to 10 years. So you'll be able to go on that 20 mile stretch and you will be able to be guaranteed a 55, 60 mile an hour speed. Uh, so that's a good thing for people because they want to get home or they got to get to a doctor's appointment. They want to get to their son or daughter's soccer game, whatnot. And people love those lanes and uh, they are great. They've done a, we, we've done a really good job on those. What about the profit and loss on those, Senator? What are they? Are we losing money or get, making money or breaking even or what? Well, you know, we want to break even and, uh, you know, we'd like to make a little money so we can reinvest in the corridor. But the main thing is to break even. But we did take a little hit during COVID because nobody was driving. So there was really no need to get in those lanes because there was no traffic on 75. But I can tell you right now, in the last 30 days, traffic is back. And, uh, you know, uh, that's a good thing. That means people are back out. They're working. They're eating out. They're spending money. The economy's back uh, in full swing. Uh, traffic is back. One of the elements of uh, your involvement with transportation has to do with uh, industrial real estate. And industrial real estate in the metro area is on fire, literally. It's probably had the best year that it's ever had. And um, obviously, the great part of that is dependent on what you're doing over there in transportation. Tell us, uh, are you focusing on industrial and in, is industrial a priority in terms of, and is manufacturing in the equation or just tell us what kind of industries you're looking at particularly as critical to our success? Well, to answer your question, all of it. I mean, we want manufacturing. We want uh, high tech manufacturing. We want manufacturing. We want uh, distribution centers. Um, we want to continue to invest in all that. And you're right. And that's why we did this Freight and Logistics Commission, because we want to capitalize on our location of being kind of right in the middle of the southeast and in our airport. The other thing we want to try to focus on is getting air cargo up. We're not even in the top 10 on air cargo, but we've got the busiest airport from a passenger standpoint. We've got to get more air cargo. And we can do that not only at Hartsfield Jackson, but we can do that at some of our smaller airports. Uh, outside of Metro Atlanta. So we're investing in those airports too. But but I, to answer your question, we definitely want to be in the manufacturing business. We want to create jobs. Um, you know, we've done that with Caterpillar. We've done it with several other companies. Uh, Baxter, I believe it is out there off I-20. Um, so we're, we're going to continue to look at any type of company that wants to come here. Uh, we are open for business. We want to stay open for business. We want you to come here and we will give you a trained workforce to make you successful. And uh, you'll love living here in Georgia. Senator, there's a great deal of uh, land available on Highway 16 down to Savannah from Macon. 
Seems like that would be an ideal uh, opportunity for manufa the manufacturing industry. Close to transportation and plenty of available land are two essential elements in that. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think you've got opportunity between Macon and Savannah right there that is, is limitless. And uh, we're gonna look at multimodal uh, facilities between there and Macon. We're looking, again, there's a couple airports that we could do air cargo from. Uh, and we've got rail right beside the uh, interstate coming up through um, Savannah up to Atlanta. So there's opportunities for uh, car manufacturing. There's opportunities for uh, other manufacturing and, and uh, also distribution. So we will be focused on that. I know the state's focused on that area. Great having you on the show, Senator Brandon Beach, and appreciate your service to our community and to our state. And uh, good luck with uh, all of the involvement that you have with transportation and education and tourism industries that are vital to, to our success. And um, appreciate your time and uh, we'd love to continue our dialogue from time to time with you to keep us abreast of major developments in your areas of involvement especially. Well, Lou, thank you for having me and thank you for what you do to let the community know what's going on uh, and keep them informed. Um, I, I would say as a citizen, everybody needs to know who their state rep is and who their state senator is to stay involved and, and call them or email them. We do listen to our constituents. So, uh, and I always say this, and I'll close with this. You don't have to be an elected official to make a difference in your community. Uh, there's a lot of ways to be involved in our communities uh, through volunteer organizations or our school system, but stay involved because it doesn't happen by accident. The reason we have great communities is we have people that want to get involved and keep it a great community. So stay involved in your communities. And thank you again, Lou, for what you did. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening. And thank you, Donna Davis at Pro Video Talent, who produced this program. Thank you for watching and listening and have a nice day.